Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Drummer's Education Connection. My name is Jeremy Steinkohler. I'm here with my friends Rick Stojak, Bart Robley. And today uh, we have a very, very special guest. His name is Jim Royal. Ready to say hi? Um, uh, so here at the Drummer's Education Connection, we provide content for drummers, for drum instructors, and really anybody who's interested in drumming. And we have roundtable discussions almost on a weekly basis about various topics related to drumming and teaching. And uh, about once a month, we are fortunate enough to have a special guest. And today our guest is Jim Royal. I'm over the moon excited to have him here. Jim is a good friend and a, and a terrific, terrific uh, player, uh, educator, uh, community leader. Um, and we're going to talk about Jim and find out his story today. And he's going to enlighten us with all sorts of pearls of wisdom. Um, before I introduce him uh, formally, I uh, want to let you know a little bit about him. Uh, Jim studied percussion and education at the University of Bridgeport, and he was fortunate enough to study uh, some pri privately with Alan Dawson, the great Alan Dawson, Max Roach, Professor Fillmore. I should mention Jim not only is a drum set wow. player, he also plays steel pans and uh, mallet percussion, so he's a jack of all trades. And Jim has been uh, running the Jim Royal Drum Studio in Connecticut for over 20 years, uh, and he's created not just a program for uh, young drummers yeah. aspiring on the drum set, but also on xylophone and marimba and vibes and uh, steel pans. He has steel pan ensembles that he puts together and he takes them to tour all over the world. He's had his, his youth groups perform at all different places in the world. We're gonna talk about that. Uh, Jim is the former uh, president of the Percussive Arts Society chapter in Connecticut for 17 years. So um, a, a titan in the industry, wow. we would say. Um, and he's wow. also an author, a published author of a book called Pansicles, which is a, a collection of steel drum ensemble pieces. Um, we're going to talk about that as well. Jim is also an active performer, or at least was before COVID, I suppose, uh, primarily with the Chris Coogan Quintet. And his group just released, a, his trio just released a new album with that group. And lastly, I'll mention that Jim endorses Mapex drums, Vic Firth drumsticks, Sabian cymbals, Remo drum heads, Latin percussion, as well as Grover Pro performance. So. Uh, we are thrilled to have you, Jim. Thanks so much for joining us today and uh, just want to get the ball rolling. So tell us a little bit about you, you've you've been in the in the business quite a long time as a player and as an educator, um, and you've established this really m robust program there in Connecticut. You've, you've put that place on the map with drum education. How did you get started with that? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you for for inviting me on your show. I've been I've been watching for quite a while and it's such a great resource for, for all of us because you're going to learn something every time. Um, and being able to jump in and, and make a little comment uh, to, to, to get to get involved makes you feel great. And, and again, I want to thank all of you for, for having me today. Um, I, I, want to, I want to fix one thing um, that uh, was in the bio is actually uh, I've been teaching privately for 35 years. Wow. And I've owned the studio now when I opened it on my own for 30 years. So, so that's wow. an update we need to fix in the bio. Wow. But wow. Um, so it's yes, 30, it's 31 years as of this year. Um, I mean, Amazing. I don't know how far back we want to go. We, we only have an hour, but let, let me just say this. And I think <laughs> this is important for all musicians that be ready for the aha moment that that happens to you. Um, my moment when I was at University of Bridgeport, I was in percussion ensemble, and my percussion director Howard Zwickler, and, and he just passed, and, and rest in peace, Howard. Um, we were in the middle of a rehearsal, and he said, uh, "Does uh, the local music store just uh, called and said they're looking for a drum set teacher? Is anybody interested?" And I have this thing about myself where I, I backed and I put my hand up and said. Yeah, I'm the guy. I want to do it. That changed the trajectory of my life by saying yes to that. Yeah. Um, again, everything yeah. is a little scary, but you know what? We don't grow and evolve um, if we don't take the leaps. And again, I was, what, 19 or, I don't know, 18, something like that at the time. And by jumping into that um, local music store... I found my niche almost immediately of not wanting to finish my music education degree uh, and be a school band director and, and wanted to do it one-on-one -on -one 
and, and be a private teacher, but do it in, in the most top yeah. professional way that I could. Yeah. Um, and so it started there. Um, and it just, I mean, we, I, we can, we could talk about how that evolved and so forth, but I, 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 I could, I'm very good at, I could take over and talk the whole time and I don't want to do that. <laughs> Um, we want so, that. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. Like answer, right? Yeah, yeah. As we go, um, but but you know, I, maybe I'll go on just for a little bit because this is important for anyone that's coming up. And you know, I'm I'm 54 now, and I've been doing this a while, and um, it, it's so important because the game certainly has changed from, from when we all started, but certain things remain the same. Um, so when I went in to teach there. Uh, I started getting a roster and it started building. But here's another big moment. That particular music school had a recital for their students at the end of the, the calendar year in June. And I thought, well, that's pretty that's pretty neat. That, that's great. And I had, a few, I had some students that participated. Well, within two or three years, my roster got so big and it got so happening that they had to have a private recital just for me while I was there. And I wanted to make it grow. So I started, you know, I brought in some mallet stuff that I could, but my room is only so big. Um, so, but that's where I learned about how important it, it is to have the recitals um, so that you're showing uh, the parents what they're doing, the kids are growing and not just going page to page and working on certain things. And that's fantastic, but giving them a vehicle and a goal to reach. So, um, and, fr and from that, I felt, you know what? One recital a year is not enough. There needs to be one mid-year. There's got to be one in January and one in June. And all this started to develop. Well, I was there for about four years or so, and I was 23 at the time, and I had to take another leap. And, and I took a chance, and I bought a house uh, in, the, in the same community area, Bridgeport, Fairfield, in Connecticut. Uh -huh. And... I had, I had to buy a house that had a finished basement because that's where the studio is going to be. Another leap, okay. another scary moment because you're going from no overhead to it's all on you. And um, But I knew mm -hmm. the way I was building it and the philosophies that I was that I was developing that I was going to make it happen. Um, and, and we did. Yep. And so now we can start doing percussion ensembles and how all that started to develop in my own home private studio so we could continue on but again i don't want to i don't want to yeah. let's we could just keep talking so i don't want to take it over no this no. is great stuff great no. stuff jim i really uh yes. I, I love being open to the aha moments that end up changing your trajectory or shaping your path that at the time you don't necessarily know what those look like until you're able to look back on them a little bit but you know just saying yes and then figuring it out you know, that's that's great advice. Bart, do you have any anything you want to <laughs> check in with Jim about? Well, I, I want to say this. First of all, Jim, thank you so much for being a part of this. This is amazing. And, and given your, you know, given your your credentials and everything, it's just it's a great honor to have you here on the deck with us. Um, I do have a I do have a question for you. One of the things that uh, I was reading in your bio is is that how um I have so many questions, but how your your students become the teachers, right? The students within within the school at Jim Royal Studios um, become the teachers. Um, I think that that's brilliant. I think that that is so amazing. So, what is your first step? Okay, we've talked over the over the course of of these videos on you know what you teach and how you teach, but where do you take that step? Where is that aha moment for a student where it's like okay? This student is ready to take on an ensemble or take on another student. How do you how do you know they're ready? Okay, well, I, I'm going to I'm going to go back to where that kind of evolved. Um, so we got to the point at, at the my, you know, my first house where the studio was in the basement where I was teaching seven days a week. Ensembles were on either Saturday or Sunday, and I don't know how my wife put up with it. And that was with two kids being born within two years. Um, and we would tag, you know, uh, wow. and so, it, so we got to the point where, okay, I could teach 40 to 50 students a week and the ensembles and then the gigs on top of it and everything that was happening. 
uh, and evolving at that time. Um, so it was time for one of my sons to go to uh, school uh, as a kindergartner. And in Bridgeport, we felt, man, I'm not sure this is where we want him to go. And so we decided mm -hmm. another moment, we're going to build a house in Monroe about a half hour away. Look out now. Um, and then I'm going to have to take the studio to a uh, to an actual commercial space. Um, oh. Another leap, another scary leap. Uh -huh. um, so, uh -huh. but at that moment, I felt it was time for me to bring somebody on because I couldn't, if I wanted the business to grow and make it more financially, uh, you know, helpful, I'd have to bring somebody on. And, I, and we got to that point. So one of my top ensemble students, uh, let's, I'll just go with Tim uh, for now. Um, he was getting ready to go to school for music education at West, Western Connecticut State University. And I knew the A-team guys, that's the top ensemble. So we have D all the way through A and you work your way up and you audition and move up. I know these guys inside and out. These are like my kids. Um, I know mm. how they tick, um, there's a mutual respect. Um, and I knew that he would he was ready to take it on even though he was going to school full time. So I said to him, hey, when we move uh, to the new space, would you like to come on a couple days a week and do some private teaching with me. He knew the philosophies in the system of what we did at the studio because he came up through the system. Mm -hmm. So it was my philosophies though, with obviously with their own um, personalities and so forth. And, and I'm always careful with chemistry with uh, you know, a student and making sure it goes with the right teacher. But yeah. that wasn't that difficult for me. And, and it kept moving with, another student that was came back from college and this student that was getting ready to make, maybe make a leap professionally playing, but he used the studio and I don't mean it in any bad way as a platform. And meanwhile, I had the incredible gift and knowledge to be with me till it was time for them to leap and go. And I'll, I'll just say this, one of my current teachers, Brian Enti, he's my assistant director. He's been a student uh, of mine since five years old. He just turned 38, and he's been teaching with me <laughs> since he got out of college. That's awesome. He, um, he, is, he is my go-to guy. We are, we are yin and yang. I am this jazz guy that just – he says – I'm well, I, I'm just going to always be honest. He said my energy is like a hamster uh, on drugs on a hamster wheel. <laughs> um, that's the kind of – <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, he's, definitely a little bit more, he's definitely more chill um he went he went to ithaca and studied with gordon stout so he brings in a whole different area of expertise so we can work off of each other um and um and other teachers have come in and out uh mainly for the most part let's say 90 percent of the teachers that i've had over the years have been former students that's and it's worked great Fantastic. That is, wow, that is great. That's great. Real, real that quick question so from Facebook. Uh, Dave Lewitt, uh, Jim, uh, are you still teaching in person lessons? I've moved uh, to 95% virtual lessons. That's from Dave Lewitt on Facebook. Just wanted to throw that out there real quick. Way to break. Oh, awesome. Um, oh, can I answer him? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just, just okay. right here. Yeah, just right here. Okay. So, so Dave, um, since September, we've been doing basically 90, 95% uh, back at the studio live with all the protocol uh, for COVID temperature when you before you come in, uh, or masks uh, all the time, uh, sanitizing. Uh, ensembles are actually running, but we're doing six feet apart in our ensemble room. I mean, the, and we haven't yet talked about where we are currently. But the answer is yes. And but I did, and this is great for everyone. I had to learn in the moment. Back in March, the third week for us here on the East Coast, we had to go all virtual. I never taught a virtual lesson in my life. Um, but I taught all basically 100% mm -hmm. of my students online right away. And I just didn't go through it. I grew through it. That's it. Yep. Just get it done. Do it. Yep. So perfect. Wow. Rick. Wow. 
Rick, you got something for Jim? Hey, hey, Jim. So now at this, yeah, yeah. So, uh, hey, a quick shout out to Chip Ritter. We want to. We're looking forward to having Chip return um, in a, in a future episode. So we wanted to say him and and Jim. Thanks for for joining us. You know, and I'm a I'm a Connecticut drummer as well. So. Any Connecticut drummer is a, a brother, man. So <laughs> I, I wish I, I had met you back back in the day. I was was in Middletown. And so um so now your studio is is in Monroe now. Is that is that what you said? No. No, the no, the studio um so we we I sold the house in Bridgeport, moved to Monroe, but I wanted to keep my base because in Fairfield okay. County and in Fairfield area. It's a huge student base for us. So I moved about three or okay. four blocks to a commercial building. Um, and um, I, I had the, the middle space, which was about a thousand square feet. Um, and at the time, there was just a back room that was going to be my space. And I had to develop the rest of the space. And we, we built two more mm -hmm. teaching rooms. And this is where mm -hmm. the next aha moment came in. The gentleman who owned this building, and it's it's a one level street level uh, building. There are three other spaces. The space next door to me was a Chinese ballet dance studio, and in my head, always again envisioning what's next, I said, "That's my ensemble room." And I said to the owner, "I said, when you want uh -huh. out, I want in. I want a building." Again, kind of crazy. I don't know. Yeah. You know, sometimes you're like, "What are you actually doing?" But I knew I could make it work. So on top of it, so I bought the building mm -hmm. um, in like 1998. And um, and then I have the two end spaces. One's a, a food a takeout. And then the other spot is a, is a barber shop. And that's a, that's a stream of income that helps maintain and take care of business with the building as well. Um, so I'm ah. also a landlord. Um, ah, okay. So, but again, Good for you. That was That's another big clever. leap. Yeah. Once the book became yeah. yeah. But it can be done. And again, I didn't go to business. I didn't go to business school. Yeah. Um, but I, I had mentors um, that helped and and, and uh, just guided me through different things. So don't be afraid to reach out to people um, that are that are good friends or ju or just other people that you know are developed in those areas uh, to help you. Never. Never be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. Ever. Right. Right. Uh, it, it's, it's so so important. That's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Had, well, that's that's yeah, a Bart. great that's a great commitment, um, Jim. That that you made. Um, I'd imagine it took a little while to start making the profit. I mean, because that's a huge investment. Um, I've I've kind of noticed it. You know, we have to. You know, if you're starting a teaching business, you have to have a little bit of savings and, and and prep yourself a little bit because it's it's not going to be big bucks streaming in right away did it did it take a while to start turning a profit um i, I never felt that i never felt that um because we That's brought great. everybody from what was happening wow. at the studio and at that point i knew then we could start adding a lot more students because i was at my max um so you know and again uh -huh. we're call it, we'll call it the teaching game of today. If you go back 10 or 20 years, it's not the same. Oh. It's not the same as it was. Right. And um, mm -hmm. we, at one point, I think we had four or five of us teaching at the same time. And um, wow. and again, things have changed a bit, but we're, we, you know, we're still, we're still rolling along, if you will, pardon the pun. Uh, things, things are still happening. Uh, there's three of us that are teaching. Um, but, you have to evolve with what's going on. Um, and um, we were just having a conversation with someone the other day about years ago, we'd always be, it's so much, it's like what, 90% word of mouth and your reputation. Right. Well, yeah. people don't talk to any, people don't talk to people mm -hmm. anymore. You know, they're so busy on their cell phone. They're not talking <laughs> yeah. anymore. So right. you're still going to have community yeah. outreach and people that will recognize you. But you have to use technology now also, uh, you know, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, whatever, putting, you know, putting ads up, Groupon, whatever it is to, to just dabble a little bit. To, to You just can't say um, 
you can't get complacent. That's what I'm saying. You can't. Um, mm -hmm. So right. uh, it's so important. It, it's so important today. Jim, you, men you mentioned the word community there. Yeah. And I, I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, I, I want to say uh, just a little backstory. I met Jim at a Percussive Art Society conference a couple of years ago. And we were standing at a, at a table, I think it was for some practice pads. And we just started talking. And it turns out, of course, we're both drummers. We're both drum teachers. We both run uh, large teaching programs that are bigger than just private lessons. And I handed him a copy of my book. He called me up a couple months later, said, oh, my God, I loved yeah. your book. I want to do a, a, pa a basic presentation with you. And we started talking about what, what we could offer that would be of value. And I just I, so much of what you're talking about just resonates so big for me. Uh, it all makes perfect sense. And one of the things I wanted to point about point out was about you haven't just created a lesson program. You've created a culture. You've created a community built around a certain kind of culture and certain values about, you know, working together and teaching and playing and working up through the ranks and paying your dues. And um, when you started this program, you know, with the with the ensembles twice a week in your in your basement, did you have any notion that this is what you were doing? Were you thinking about it like, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to create this this program and you, you were dreaming big or it was sort of like it just kind of kept growing on its own and you took the challenges that they came um I, i'd say it's a little of all of that mm -hmm. um i was always dreaming big and for me it was another vision that i had i wanted to take to fruition um and sometimes they seemed a little crazy uh whether it was through the studio um or even known you know, playing. Um, I mean, way back to 25 years ago, I mean, I, I'm a small group jazz and big band drummer per se. And I'm like, you know what? I'm, you know, I love big bands drumming so much. I want to start my own big band. Yeah. And I did. And, and it was the Jim Royal all-star big band. And I, I had a library that colleges would dream of, of, of charts. I mean, it, it, whatever it was that I said I wanted to do, either you can decide to do it or you could regret the fact that you never tried it. Yeah. And, and I, and I, and I voice that to my students all the time. Um, you don't want to have regrets, especially when you're younger, um, to try certain things. That's the time to do it. Uh, and, uh, so I, I, I completely ag agree uh, with what you said. It's, it's a little of all of, all of that. For sure. That's beautiful, man. That uh, you're you're you're, uh, you're such a, a role model for so many of us, you know, just pursuing your dreams, saying yes, taking chances, and uh, building. You know, you you've put a really substantial program together, and you've got a really thriving community there. So kudos to you. Really, really cool yeah, to see. You. Bart, you had something. Oh yeah, I got I got a question. Um, <clears throat> I w again looking through your bio and just listening to your talk and and your passion for this is I think that that's something that is so infectious to everybody, right? I mean, you have to, I think as a teacher, you have to have that. People have to pick up on that that, that infectious and how much you love it. Years ago, uh, I had the great opportunity to study with Robert Slack and uh, Matt Johnson at, at Fullerton College here in California. And Matt is the first chair percussionist for the Pacific Symphony. Now, my question is this, looking at, at what you're doing at the studio there, at the, at the Jim Royal Studio, you're teaching marimba and you have these percussion ensembles and stuff. And I know that to play for a symphony, you have to be groomed for that. I mean, you have to be groomed for that from a little kid all the way up through college. And you have to be invited to audition for a symphony. Is that something that that you have had happen there at Jim Royal Studios? Is that something that you guys do? Because it sounds outstanding. It sounds amazing. And that's what it sounds to me like a little bit. Maybe you groom people for that. It, it's, 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 it's exactly what we do. Um, everywhere from someone, someone going to school um, that was, say, on our A team, right? And they're playing college level material, uh, whether it's, percussion ensemble or steel pan stuff. So wherever they go, you know, the teachers are always like, can you send me more of that kid? You know, um, so uh, we, we just thrive on that, that, that they're ready uh, to go to and take that next leap. I mean, I mean, we should, sometimes people say, man, you should start doing a roster of, of where you, what your kids have, where they've gone, what they've done. And, and it's kind of like some of it's written down, some of it's up here. 
I mean, currently I have two students that are working on their doctor music. Um, and uh, so excited so, um, for them. You know, so cool. a, kid, a kid who's in, uh, he might be in the Wyoming, he's principal percussionist in the Wyoming Symphony. Um, oh. it, it just goes on and on, whether you're a drum set guy, there's a kid, a kid you know, he's, in, he's a grown adult, he's probably in his mid to late 30s, who is currently playing for Lady Antebellum. So it runs the whole gamut uh, of, you know, whether you're more of an orchestral guy or, uh, a, you know, like a Broadway type of drummer or everything in between. And they, and they are being groomed for that, uh, getting kids uh, ready for Western region, all state, and for their college auditions. Um, and we're right in the middle of that now with, with a lot of our kids. And again, for them right now, it's a different story because a lot of it's going to be uh, a, a recording that they do or they send in, or it's going to be a Zoom audition. And I feel bad for them. It's not the same, but it, it is what it is right now. Right. Um, so, but we want to make yeah. sure that, that they're ready and, and we, we, we love it. And, and, and one of the things that happens here, uh, the, the infectious enthusiasm that, that runs through the building is that we have an open door policy here. If you are a student here, whether you're in an ensemble or not, when it's not COVID, our door is open for you to come in and practice whenever you want. Wow. We have enough awesome. members and, wow. and stuff everywhere where you could, you could, you could, there's no excuse not to get your work done. No excuse. And and I love it. So when wow. I hear the kids come in and wow. I hear somebody practicing or timpani or whatever, how does that not make you feel great? How does that not, it re-energizes me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you have to be willing yeah. to do that. And then again, when I bought the building and I got the space next door, that changed the game. And then we have basements in both uh, uh, spaces as well. And our steel pan yard, as we call it, is in the basement next door. Um, so we've used every inch uh, of, of the studio and um, so that students can, can work on anything they need uh, at, at pretty much any time. If we're open, they could come in and practice. Wow. That is fantastic. What, a, what an amazing service you're providing to that community. Yeah. Jim. That's really unbelievable. That, that really is great. great. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Jim, I want you, to you ask just you. Does that think include drum me. set too, Jim, that you've got drum set? Oh, you, I mean, I, I'm a, I'm, that's my main. So drum set, big time. And you mean you need to come into practice, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, if there's a if there's a drum room open uh or a practice space open that has a drum set you can practice yes that's jim great. i want i want to ask you about that's another great. aspect of your program there that's totally impressed me uh i remember when we first met and you told me that not only did you have these steel pan ensembles but you were going to jamaica with them or you were going i forget where yeah. else you were going you can tell us but i i know that you're you've taken your student ensembles to perform around the world what an incredible opportunity for these young musicians to travel. How do you put that together? I mean, what, what, what did you just think? Oh, these guys are great. I should take them on the road. Um, well, okay. So we got, we got, we got a half hour, man. We, we can get this done. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Brian just actually walked in the door and kind of scooted past us. His father was one of my big mentors. And he was a businessman, um, so giving. And um, he helped me to, to push me on some of those moves. And one of them was, Jim, your ensembles do great things in our little small area. Um, but maybe you should consider uh, taking them outside our own state. And at the time, um, and I think a lot of you might be aware of Bands of America, it's an organization. I was going to um, ask that, about that. I was going to ask about that. So, yeah. yes. Yeah. The, the name has changed. It can be marching band. And then when that season's over, they have competitions nationwide for, um, for concert bands and wind ensembles, as well as percussion ensembles. And you had to send oh. in a recording to get picked to go, to go. And that it's in Indianapolis, Indiana. So it's like, wow, if we get picked, you know, we're going to have to drive or whatever because, 
you know, there were some things that you could borrow percussion wise, but a lot of the stuff you had to bring. And we, we our, our first national tour uh, going outside the state was in Indianapolis in 1998 at Bands of America. And, um, and talk about having to raise your game. Uh, you know, again, you're doing xylophone rag pieces, you're doing um, roll off uh, percussion, you know, type pieces and some of the heavyweight stuff in, in the college level area. And, and we and you could go every other year. So we did that for a handful of years. And I thought that was that was great. And then I said, OK, what are we going to do next? So one of the things we did was we, we went on a cruise ship and went to the Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean. And we played on the cruise ship with three of our three of our steel pan ensembles. Um, Very cool. Totally wild. The families got to go. Another whole new experience. Um, prior to doing Bands of America, I took them to Disneyland and Disney World to perform, and we performed in those wow. areas. Um, again, with with the help of Brian Enti's father, Stephen. Uh, to sort of like keep me rooted. I was young. I was like 25-ish, wow. you know, whatever that was, you know, late 20s. Um, but about 15 years ago, I said, well, okay, wait, I got to go back. Percussive Art Society, if, if you're not a member, you should be a member. Okay, it changed my life. Okay, I've had, I've been to, the Percussive Art Society International Convention since 1987, and I've never missed one. Wow. Even this year when it was virtual, I didn't miss it. Yeah. Um, so going to the convention, I saw a whole new world of college ensembles performing, high school ensembles performing, um, seeing my first steel band, a mass steel band on the stage. That's when I said, I want to do that. I want to do that with our kids. Uh, so I bought our steel band yeah. hands and we got started. And that evolved into that being a big part of who we are. The kids absolutely love it. And if any student is a little bit leery about playing mallets, because sometimes that could be a little bit scary. Yeah. Playing steel pan, as they do in Trinidad, a lot of times you learn by rote, by ear. But obviously we're training for the reading part. They build more confidence on the steel pan, which then goes into what's happening on the mallets, and it helps to balance and build the confidence. It's the gateway um, instrument. So that's outstanding. It, it really is. It, it was a game changer. We'll never look back. It's always going to be forward with that. So, um, so, so with that, we decided. Oh, so I'm at a chapter president's meeting, and I was chapter president for 17 years, and I loved every second of it. OK, it was a volunteer position. But to me, it was like another job. I wanted to bring great stuff to Connecticut. Um, so I went to the chapter president's meeting. I happened to sit next to the chapter president for England over the pond. And I started telling him about who we are. And he said, hey, how would you like to bring your kids to England and perform for our chapter day? Wow. Now, he may have been uh... he may have been cordial. He was being cordial or whatever. Not from my point of view. He invited me. <laughs> I contacted him immediately when I got back, and I said, I'm going to take you up on that. I want to bring our kids over. That was the first overseas trip we did 15 years ago, and we've gone overseas ever since every other year. Where, we, where it was England. Um, it was England, Italy. Um, we went to Trinidad. We had to go to Trinidad where the steel pan was made. Ghana. Uh, Ireland, Jamaica. Wow. We went back to to uh, to uh, Trinidad again. We were supposed to go to England in 2021, where we all where it all started, but unfortunately, with COVID, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, but we'll be back uh, on a plane soon enough when things get better. So th these trips with these ensembles. First of all, how many ensembles cool. do you take on these trips? Only the A team goes on the overseas trips. So how many, and was it about 15 people in the on, pan ensemble? Um, 15 would be on a high end. Usually it's somewhere between 10 or 12 students. Plus their parents? No, they don't, no, they don't have to go. I mean, we always have a few parents that do go, but Chaperone. look, so most of these kids that get to that, 
get to that point, they've been with me since they were in fourth grade. So right. the trust level is completely solid. And they right. know that if they mess up on that trip, they're done. over. Yeah. Because it's our probably, reputation that's on the line. Right. Sure, so, sure. so you get these kids buying in with the trust. I completely get it in the culture. And it's beautiful. Um, how, what a, that's a pretty giant logistic undertaking to take 10 kids and a couple of adults to a foreign country. I mean, is that something you manage all by yourself? Are you wearing, I, I just, I'm thinking about how many hats you wear, Jim. And I, I'm imagining this closet that's full of hats and you open the door and they're all <laughs> <spilling out. laughs> Yeah, man. So do you organize that personally? But, do you have uh, other people that are, that take care of the logistics? Well, Let's say I, I, I take care of at least 75% of the logistics, maybe 80. Wow. Um, one of my former students, um, his, his mom is a like top end travel agent. And then oh. so I would be developing the relationships of where we're going. And then she would put the trip together in that regard. Um, and then on top of where we would perform, we're seeing the country and, and enjoying the whole trip. So do you, um, that do you part, I, I would leave to a professional. Do you schedule? Oh, so as I was going to ask, yeah. do you schedule sort of other cultural activities for them to engage in the in the place they're in and learn about where they are? And absolutely, that's the whole thing. I mean, it it's life changing. I mean, when we yeah. went to China, when we went to China, we toured it there. Um, wow, it, it always is for me too. I mean, you know, I'm a kid from Connecticut who never went on vacation when I was a kid. <laughs> You know, go out yeah. and play, you know, baseball in the backyard. I mean, we didn't, and that's okay. But, I mean, kids will come up to me and say, Jim, this is this is the biggest thing I've ever done in my life. Wow. And and uh, so when we got to China and when we, when, you know, we had our performing and we did our thing, we went to the Great Wall and we climbed up on the Great Wall and I took a turn and looked to my right or my left. Your life can't be the same ever. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Good on you. Totally I mean, inspiring, that, Jim. Oh, Thank that, you. Beautiful. That is awesome. That's that part, is that's so part, great. That's yeah. That's 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 unbelievable. I mean, you you know, I think that that at that level for the you know, I mean, and this goes without saying, I think, but those those kids, no matter where it takes them in life, they're gonna look back on that experience, yeah. no matter where music takes them, yeah. and they have that. I got to go and walk on the, you know, stand on the Great Wall of China because of Jim Royal and that school. That is, that is absolutely huge. You know, people's lives are, are forever changed after that. Like you said, that is outstanding. Way to go. Good, good on you. That's fantastic, well, Jim. Thank, so thank you. I mean, that, in, in the bond that that A team has, is, we call it. You know, once you're an A team and you're alumni, you're A team forever. And and those you know, young men, and, and we do have some ladies that pop in, you know what I mean? That, that and I wish there were more, uh, you know, young ladies that, that were in, involved. Um, but, um, it keeps the guys on their toes, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, but, uh, their bond is so strong that your their, their friendships that you're going to have forever, because it's a little different than just being in school with them. And you have your friends, they meet right. that group meets, once a week, once a week for two hours. And we got to get it done in two hours. And that's splitting steel pan repertoire and also percussion ensemble repertoire and getting it done. And we just played this past weekend for uh, tree lighting in Monroe. And that, that's the extent, unfortunately, of a live performance because of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. Normally, we have a beautiful concert in a, in a church and all the ensembles would perform. So instead... We're going to be doing a recording in the ensemble room for all those kids this week uh, and next week, um, and and uh, we'll 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 at least be able to share it that way this time. Jim, I've, I've got, a, I've, I've, I've got a, just go a quick question. How do I get onto the A Team Ensemble? <laughs> yeah, me too. I want to play. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Well, I want to join. You know what? You certainly could be on the A Team, but you have to audition. Um, right. Okay. <laughs> uh, and in, in every level, it moves up. I mean, to make a ensemble, you're doing a four mallet piece. You're doing, it changes every other year. You're doing a like Delacluse style snare piece. 
uh, wow. or rudimental on another year and you're doing a timpani piece, there's scales, there's rudiments, and you've got to score a certain level. And I always tell this story um, that my son Ryan played percussion uh, all the way through high school, and he went to college at UConn and studied for two years uh, as a music major. When it was his turn to audition for the A-team, unfortunately, he didn't make it. He wasn't happy with me. Um, <laughs> but that. But that's the example to this, to my students is that we don't give away anything. You got to earn it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. And that was the year we were going to tour in Italy. So, so unfortunately, he wasn't thinking oh. enough, and didn't work hard enough. Um, but but unfortunately for him, our kids couldn't go. So I said to him, "Look, I have an early Christmas present for you. Mm. If you promise me that you'll get the work done." And uh, you could you could go and perform this on the trip, but that's you're still going to be in the B ensemble when we get back, and you got to audition for A ensemble again next year. No messing around. I love that story, Jim. You did it's it perfect. Jim. Yeah, Bart, you got a question? Yeah, Jim, that's that's incredible. Do you find you know sometimes in in the music business or uh, you know whatever it is, it's it's like anything else in life. Sometimes you know the competition or the pressure will crush you, you know, and I, I've seen it happen a lot, you know, as we all have, do you find that your a team, I'm sure it's inspirational to the, to the, to the B team and the C team, but do you find that the a team wants to help the, the B team and the, and, and the C team come up to their level? Do they, do they like, Hey guys, come on, let's get in and get this done. Do they want to help? Is that something, is that, is it like a great friendly competition where they, they work with one another? Do you find that? Uh, absolutely. There's, there's inner studio, um, help all the time and, and, and they inspire each other. Um, because I always remind them that you were the C team guy. You were in the D ensemble and you had to move up. So you got to remember where you came from. Right. And without question, they inspire each other and help each other all the time. Awesome. Absolutely. Love that. Yeah. Again, again, the culture that came from you and comes from your values and that you're instilling in these young kids. It's just a beautiful thing. It really is. It's 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 a matter of fact, there's a couple of comments on on Facebook right now. Uh, Jacob Sosa says, hello, gents. Dave uh, Lewitt, very inspiring, Jim. And he also gave you a bunch of thumbs up on the no excuses. I, I love that one. One of my I think uh, if you're successful in any walk of life, especially if you're if you're an entrepreneur and, and self-employed as a as a musician and you can you can make a buck at it and make a name for yourself. You have to have a phenomenal work ethic. And I tell you, yours is obviously second to none, second to none. And it's, it's very inspiring. So, yeah. so yeah. thank you for that, Jim. Very, very, very inspiring. Thank you for that. That's great. Hey, you're Jim, you're welcome. You and, um, I, I love the Mets and I love the Steelers. Although they didn't help me out last night. Okay. Um, <laughs> I grew up a Mets man myself. And, and, um, and, and, and in the spring and in summer, uh, I, I guess for me when I was a kid, it was baseball and drumming. And so I still play competitive softball today. Yeah. Me too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Oh, cool. Uh, Twice a week. Third base, the hot, third oh. base, the hot corner. Oh, Jim, when you come out to California, uh, you're going to come wife, on when we have a game and you're going to, you're going to be a guest on my team. <laughs> sure. Awesome. Uh, there you go. Uh, awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, Check hey, this out. Jim, this, this is this great. Go ahead. As, as uh, I was reading again on your bio, you said you were the, you were the president of your chapter of the percussive art society in Connecticut. And it said what it said for, for 13 years? Is that what you said? 17. 17. Okay. So my bad. 17. What does that, what does that entail? What does that job entail? Like you said, I know it's voluntarily uh, done and you, but you took it as a, like a real job. You treated it like such as, as I can tell. 
What does that entail? Right. What, what was the, what's the gig entail? What do you do? Well, your, your, one of your main goals is that you're going to be putting on one huge day of percussion um, a year, like the big Percussive Arts Society convention okay. on a smaller scale. That is the big thing that you would do. And if you could do some community events in and, in and around that throughout the year, uh, that's great too. Um, and, and whatever we, we can re reach, um, community reach, we could do. But that chapter day, um, it could be what you want it to be. I mean, my thing was that I always wanted to get people in that we normally wouldn't be able to see. Now, being in Connecticut, I could pull from New York City. I could pull from Boston. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one of the years, um, I would put feelers out. And one of the years, I put a feeler out to Steve Smith and Greg Bizonette. And Who are they? They both they both said yes. So I had them both come anyway. Wow. And I wasn't sure about how the finances were gonna work. Um, but well, of course I knew because I I, I mean I couldn't do it if I didn't have the finances, but um it, it was an incredible success. Um, but here's the here's the thing. When I first came on as chapter president, I was given a check for three hundred and something dollars to start our chapter over because it was kind of it was kind of um hiatus a long time what are you doing with three hundred dollars that's not enough for postage to try to like put some mailers out right um yeah. so my first year uh, i got help i had my, my my teacher in college arthur Lip lipner and i had actually um great drummer I, and if I, I think i have this right jerry morales who played in Spira Jira. Um, yep. You know, came out and I just started to get the ball rolling and started to build funds. Uh, and I would I would really work the industry and, and make sure that they would help. Um, and and that's been so such a big help to me over the years in, in many ways, um, to the point where I don't know, in the middle of being chapter president, we had Mike Portnoy for one of our days of percussion um, when Dream Theater was big. Right. And people were lined out the door to see Mike Portnoy. And that took our account from where it was and, and just blew it up. Uh, and I just wanted to keep bringing, whether it was uh -huh. Lee Howard Stevens on mallets, whether it was, oh, we had um, uh, great um, Brazilian percussionist uh, who played in Return of Forever. Um, Ayrton? Yes. I, I didn't, I, I never felt like I'm going to hold back. I'm like, I'm going to find out where he is. I'm going to call him. I'm going to contact. And he, and he showed up. I mean, he was playing at, at Radio City or something that night. But I said, you know what? We'll come pick you up and we'll bring you back. But we want you to be there. And he said, yes. Wow. That's he, so great. He brought all his suitcases with toys wow. and, he, and he turned that, that particular clinic into just it was, we were all in his world. It was amazing. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted Fantastic. to bring something that wasn't normal to the day. That's outstanding. On Facebook, we got a comment from uh, Kelly Ray Tubbs. Uh, she's been watching us for the last couple of weeks. Uh, she said she saw Louis Belson and Ed Shaughnessy on chapter day events. Amazing. Um, was that, uh, I don't know if that was one of yours, but did you have, was, was that one of yours, Jim? No, no, it wasn't because I mean Ed oh. Shaughnessy was probably living in LA yeah. uh, at the time, and I did see him at Pasic, but no, uh, Louis Belston and I also saw at Pasic over the years, but we we didn't have him um, for for a day of percussion. No, but that's great. Oh yeah, yeah. Louis Louis's name comes up a lot, man. What a what a. I got I got to see him play a couple times. I got to meet him a few times. Real sweetheart of a guy. That's 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 cool. So his name pops up every once in a while. Rick, you have a question, buddy. I I, I stepped on you. I'm sorry. What were you gonna say? Hey hey Jim, I'm wondering if you um host clinics at this point at, at your studio, and if you um are in retail as well. Okay. Um, we, we are in retail and, and that, that is a part that's very helpful uh -huh. to our parents. Um, uh -huh. but this is something that I always share that I know it's an old saying, don't forget where your, where your bread's buttered. And I know that my bread is buttered 
with the lessons. Mm -hmm. So I right. never was going to let the sales part pull me underneath. Never. Mm -hmm. Because it can happen. Oh, you got to have all these drum sets and you got to have this and you got to have that. That could ruin you. So I mm -hmm. always made sure right. that I was very careful about that. Um, so, um, you know, mm -hmm. as an endorser for those different companies, that certainly helps us in getting all the basics of sticks and drum heads. And I could basically get whatever they need, but it's definitely more of a convenience and, and not trying to be uh, like Drummer's okay. World in New York City years ago. That that That's over the top. That's too much. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. What, what was the other question? Yeah. Um, Rick, do you host clinics also? Oh, um, on occasion, uh, we, we do have some people in and I would, I would kind of use when they were coming for a day of percussion, they would come in, uh, uh the, the night before and they would either do some private teaching for kids that wanted a lesson with that particular artist. And we had Tony Royster Jr. When he was still a young kid come in and do lessons that night. Um, wow. but the thing that's tough is we are so busy here with all our lessons and our ensembles every week, it's challenging to do. And I, I do think about that from time to time and we have the space next door to do that. But sometimes we're just so just involved in with what we're doing that it, that kind of gets unfortunately put to the wayside, but I, I, I don't want to rule that out. That's, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. How many people do you have teaching there now, Jim? How many people are at the, at, at the studio now teaching? How many teachers? Yeah, there Currently, there are three of us teaching, okay. um, which which is covering, mm -hmm. um, you know, our, our student body. And then uh, Brian Enti is my assistant director for he teaches two ensembles. I teach two ensembles. And then we have our adult community steel band, which is called Silver Steel, which is mm -hmm. about 16 or 17 pieces. It's like a big band. Um, wow. and, and they rehearse on Monday nights. And that was supposed to be just a cute little thing that parents wanted to be a part of because their students were in a steel band. Well, that's turned into like not last summer, but other summers, they could do 35, 40 gigs in a summer. Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, never expected Whoa. it to be that. I mean, I had to buy, I had to purchase an equipment truck. I mean, I, I bought an old U-Haul truck that was in good shape. I put signage all over it because I just needed quality of life for all the instruments and everything. And it works great for recitals when we got to put the mallet instruments up and everything. So different moves that you have to make and commit back to your studio. If you're going to do it privately, if you want to make those next steps. And I always wanted to make the next steps. So look, they are legitimate write-offs for you on your taxes. Um, right. And, mm -hmm. you know, you got to invest back in the business. And that's what we've done all these years. And I never hesitate uh, to do that if we can. Um, and, and, and thankfully, we're, we're, things are still going strong. Um, you got to be careful. Um, but you want to invest back. Right. Jim, uh, when you think about, well, when, when we think about other drum teachers who are, you know, I, I imagine some some younger, newer teachers might watch this interview of you and find out about what you're doing and just be like jaw hitting the floor. Like, Oh my God, this guy's built an empire, you know, like so many <laughs> different aspects and levels of what you're doing. Um, and, and with, with the, the ensembles and the private lessons and the work and the retail and the clinics and the touring, um, man, you've got it going mm. on. It's like, a, it's like a dream, you know, I mean, you just created this incredible uh, organization and community and program obviously not everyone's going to reach that level of success or that level of, you know, having all of those different kinds of irons in the fire. Some people, they're just interested in, you know, creating a private practice for themselves, but maybe some of those people are looking to maybe diversify a little bit, get some ensembles going. Uh, what advice do you have for a, a young drum teacher who's, who's eager to break out of just teaching private lessons and maybe get some, what's the next step for them? Well, that that's a, a challenging question because demographically takes a is a big part of how that's going to work for somebody right um because in some of those communities their their own school systems can have a lot of that built into it already mm -hmm. where there could be percussion ensembles there or, or in, in a lot of parts of the united states there could be steel bands going on so 
you really have to do your due diligence and your and your in your work on making sure where you're thinking about developing it and evolving a program, it's suitable and, and possible in that area. That's first and foremost. Um, and then you just have to go about it slowly. Um, and if you want to start building an ensemble, I mean, just the way I did it, I didn't buy all these instruments in one shot. I mean, <laughs> you start with a marimba and you add a vibraphone. Then I added some timpani. I had to do it a little bit at a time because I wasn't given a stipend from my father of 50 grand and say, go out and buy all the stuff that you need. No, I bought it as I could afford it. And I built things a little by little. And then a big part of it too was going into the schools and and supporting your kids with what they're doing in school. And that's a big part of what I, I, I'll say. And I'll say it to my first student that's going to come in here at 315. What's going on at school band? What's going on? What's happening with this? What's happening with that? So you are connected to what they're doing so that it's feeding to their teachers and that you have a great relationship with their teachers uh, at school. And they know that you're developing incredible drummers and percussionists for them. So things can start to evolve that way. And it just starts to, you know, the fire starts to get a little bigger and a little bigger, but it's, you can't go super big right away. You have to you have to right. build it slowly from the ground up and and just be patient. You got to be patient as you go. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd be willing to talk yeah. to anybody about it in more detail uh, if they want to connect with me on Facebook um, or by email or, or whatever. I'm, I'm wide open to it. And we should mention, uh, Jim, you can find out more about Jim's program at jimroyaldrumstudio.com. And Royal is spelled R-O-Y-L-E. Yes. Fantastic. That is uh, fantastic. Do you guys have any other uh, uh, closing uh, uh, questions for, for Jim or comments or observations before we sign off? Rick, you go first. Well, well, Jim, your your commitment to your drumming career is very evident and very impressive. And it sounds like the payoff has been really, really fantastic. So, so, you know, thank you for all you're doing for the drumming community. And, uh, it warms my heart that Connecticut has you, man. So thank I, you. I wish you years and years of more success and, and, uh, down the road, it'd be great to have you, have you back. We're just, just in the beginning stage. Sure. Of education connection and and just stay safe and and keep on it and you're doing you're doing an amazing job and and it's not to meet you man yeah Thank you. Jim, same here I, I, I gotta second that I you know I've often said that I think that music is something that is uh it's the most important gift that we've been given it's I've said this in past interviews here on the deck and it's there at every you know point in our life you know it's it's there at sad times at, at good times when people get married when people die when babies are born we celebrate to music and um, and the fact that you are touching so many people's lives with music as an instructor as as a performer as an author as a as a you know i mean everything that you've mentioned that you do it's just it's fantastic it is so great and i think you're a shining example of you know if you love something just blow that love back into it and it's going to come back to you a hundredfold and and man again good on you and thank you so much for being a part of this and i thank you for being you know i mean being part of the it's it's an honor to be a yeah. part of the drumming world with you so thank you so much yeah. right? this is great yeah jim it, it's been a, a total I appreciate that. A total pleasure and an honor to have you on here. You know, you talk about those aha moments. I feel like I had one of those aha moments when I met you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And that sparked a lot of inspiration for me. And the, the, the more I get to know you, the more I enjoy it. And I think we have a lot of great things in the future together to work on together. I hope we do get to present at PASIC together at some point. Um, and, uh, man, just keep on doing what you're doing. You're an inspiration to us. and You're an inspiration to your students. And uh, anybody who would care to, to know about what you're doing, is is it's a... A privilege. Thank you. Well, I, uh, Jeremy, I, I appreciate that. And um, I felt the same way when we were at PASIC. And um, you know right away when you have chemistry with someone. 
Yeah. Uh, and we, we talked for about 10 minutes or so. And I knew that day there was something special there between us. Um, and then once I read your book, I felt like I was reading a book that I wrote um, <laughs> about, about, about so many things that happened in my career. And it like blew me away. I'm still in awe and I'm going to read it again and again. I mean, there is so much in that book. Jeremy, that was so well written. That was so well written. Um, I can't say enough about your book. Well, Jim, and and you know what? I I don't, I don't, I don't need to, you know what? We don't need to blow smoke up. You know, you know what? I mean, I'm being honest. That is a fabulous book. And I, 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 people to to read it and i I was going to take it with me today thank you for grabbing that yes please finding the groove you can find it on amazon you're going to connect with something in there and it's going to inspire you to want to to reach to something else or to something you have that you weren't doing uh, already and it's just fabulous so it's an honor for me to be here with you guys today and let's not say uh you know, that, you know, we're going to, well, we're going to do it again at some other point. We can get into more detail. We, we scratched the surface today right. and, and, you know, at some point let's do another one and I'll, we'll share some more and, and get more people excited about private teaching and not to be scared to do it because you can do it. It can happen. Well, Jim, you're a shining example for the entire drumming community. Thank you. And thank you for your kind words of praise coming from you. That means so, so much to me. And uh, and again, an honor to have you. And uh, if you have any questions, you can still post them in the Facebook chat or on YouTube. Uh, We can answer them after the fact, even if you're watching this on a recording. Um, And tune back in next week. Uh, I forget what we have going on exactly next week, but it's going to be something cool. That's for sure. Um, (laughs) To Drummer's Education Connection. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Jim Royal, our special guest. Thanks to Bart and Rick. And uh, we'll see Chip Ritter back here next week, hopefully. Bye, everybody. Yay, Jingle Bells. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.